journey. The journey. The journey. You just keep moving forward with what you're doing and life will show you what you want to do. Welcome back to another episode of The Journey. The Journey is a show that really focuses on Memphis iconic figures, homegrown iconic figures. Today, we're not going to disappoint you. We have the CEO and president and founder of Ewing Moving and Storage Inc. Uh, probably the biggest relocation, moving and relocation company, a uh, black moving and relocation company in the Mid-South. Mr. Ewing, we're going to jump right in. Yes, sir. Tell us, who outside of your parents had the biggest impact on your life and why? I would say it would have to be my pastor, uh, Reverend V.B. Brown. He's my former pastor. He stayed across the street from me, and he allowed me to shadow him as a little boy everywhere he went, and that was the greatest exposure I could have. Fantastic. All right, the next of the rapid fire round. What decision did you make that probably turned that you didn't know at the time, but became a life altering decision in retrospect? Uh, when I graduated from Booker T. Washington High School, I felt like I was uh, I had graduated from college only to find out that that wasn't enough education. And I had to go back to school and go to college and get some college education. Right. So I would say education was the lo- the best decision I made in my life that altered it for forever. Now, you've become one, as I said, an icon here in the city. Mm-hmm. You've made many things happen and, and been a part of many initiatives. Mm-hmm. When did you know that you were going to be successful? And what point in your life did you say, oh, yeah, I can do this. I can make this. Well, it was in uh, 1993. I uh, had to go before the Public Service Commission in uh, Nashville in order to get my intrust state authority. Well, in order to do it. What does that mean? Intrust state authority means it gave me the ability to run between all points in Tennessee. I could take a load from Memphis to New York, but couldn't take one from Memphis to Nashville or Memphis to Chattanooga. So I went to get my intrust state authority. They told me it was two things I had to have, convenience and necessity. And if I was working a full time job, it was not convenient for my customers to use me. So I resigned from the commercial appeal in 1993, went before the Public Service Commission, didn't know whether or not I was going to get the authority or not, got the authority and never looked back. Wow. That's great. (laughs) That's fantastic. Um, In your early years, I'm going to take you back to your early years. Mm Mm-hmm. You were born in an area or were raised in an area very near Claiborne Home Projects, definitely South Memphis. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about that community and what did that community instill in you? Uh, The old African uh, cliche is it takes a village to raise a child is as true as it could be. The village helped raise me. I had men around there at the barbershop that gave me guidance. I was a shoeshine boy at the barbershop. I worked at the mechanic shop. I fixed cars all the way up until I was 18 years old. Nothing but older men. It was three old men, and those old men groomed me. They told me how to shave. They taught me how to communicate, how to be a a gentleman. So it was the community. The janitor at the school would whoop our butts. If my mama, she would call my mama and tell us that we were late, that we didn't come to school, that we were cutting up at school. The community helped to raise us. And that was critical, man. I mean, you could, people across the street, I said, that old snitching old lady, she tell it. <laughs> they round beside the house smoking. Whatever went on, the uh, China, the Chinese store there around the corner, I worked there. I was raised with their kids. So the whole community helped to raise us. I love South Memphis. Fantastic. <laughs> What's your why? Why do you get up every day and do what you do? What is the thing that's driving you? I'm driven. My passion, uh, I have two passions. One, I uh, want to see our community be successful and our people be successful. And number two, it is my ministry. 
God told me long time ago, you and moving service is your ministry. You can minister to more people through your business than you can behind the podium. So I wasn't called to preach behind the podium. I was called to minister to the city. Fantastic. What were your dreams of your childhood? And 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 when you were dreaming of a childhood, now that you can look back, how far off were you when you were dreaming as a child? Well, I was I was uh, like I said, my mentor and uh, my shadow was a preacher. So I thought that I was going to be a preacher one day. I really and everybody else thought it as well uh, that I would be a preacher. But my ministry took off in a whole different way, because when I was trying to decide what I wanted to do, my I went to my pastor. I would get off. I was working at Commercial Appeal. I would work, get off at seven in the morning mm -hmm. and I'd go by his house and wake him up or whatever. Get up. Talk to me. I said, I got a decision I'm making. I'm going back to school and I don't know what to take. He said, let me tell you something, young man. He said, whatever you choose to be, you're going to need to have some business sense. He said, I don't care if you're a preacher, if you're a police, if you're a newscaster, whatever. You're going to need some business sense. So go to school and learn business. And that's what I did. And who, lo and behold, I became a businessman. Oh, wow. And that's prophetic. Very that, prophetic. It was very yeah. prophetic. Tell me the, a moment. I want you to think about this. Mm -hmm. The moment that you realized you were black. Well, like I said, it was a Chinese store that was uh, in the neighborhood. And um, these Chinese were very active in the community. And I was trying to, and, and the little girl, her name was Elizabeth Tong. I never will forget it. Elizabeth uh, was a very beautiful Chinese girl. And I liked Elizabeth, and Elizabeth liked me. But they, her dad said, That's, that can't happen. You're black. She's Chinese. You can't marry her. You can't date her. So I knew the, that's when I realized there was a difference between black and white. The other time I realized uh, was when Martin Luther King was killed. Martin Luther King was killed in 68. I was born in, in 59. Right. So I was about eight, eight years old when it happened. And the National Guard uh, were in the city at the time. And they came to our neighborhood and they shot out lights in people's houses. Uh, yeah, man, they, they, they were very critical of our community. And it was because we were black. They wasn't doing it in the white community. Right. They was only doing it in the black community. Curfews were out. We were uh, told that we had to stay off the streets. And it was only for blacks. White people were still out. They were still doing everything. Wow. And that's when I really realized and I was eight years old. Fantastic. Well, listen, as you saw in the rapid round, mm -hmm. Mr. Ewing has a lot to say <laughs> and has a lot to impart to our kids and to our men in this community. So listen, we're going to be right back on the other side. Stay right there. We got some bills to pay, but we're going to come back with more from Mr. Charles Ewing of Ewing Moving and Storage Inc. Funking up your airwaves and jamming the good information in your ear. Once again, it's Funky Politics. Funky Politics. Funky Politics. Welcome back to The Journey. And as I said, we have more from Mr. Charles Ewing of Ewing Moving and Storage Inc. Charles, we went through the rapid fire in the first segment. Now we're going to unpack it all and let people really understand who you are. Okay. So the first question your childhood and family life. Where were you raised? And tell us about the dynamic of home. I was raised in South Memphis, uh, Walker and Wellington. Uh, stayed in two different houses on the same street. Uh, one was 466 Walker Avenue and the other one was 465. 466 was next door to the preacher and 465 was across the street. In our community, uh, we had a very close-knit community. Uh, my mom was the Avon lady. Uh, my pastor stayed across the street. Up the street was uh, uh, the barber shop on the corner. Then there was a corner sundry, Coulter sundry. Then a down down the street a little bit farther from that was Mason Temple, mm -hmm. uh, which I got a lot of work at Mason Temple. 
across the street from Mason Temple was the mechanic shop that I worked at, uh, Jones Boys Garage, and up the street was Mississippi and Walker. Mississippi and Walker had four way grill up there. You had uh, which is a, was a popular. Uh, mm -hmm. eating location. You had the dry goods store right on the corner. Then you had a red house, shoe shine parlor, and pool hall. Okay. So I got a chance. To, the community was just uh, vibrant. Right. I mean, we spent money in the community. We made money in the community. We spent money in the community. So uh, that was my uh, upbringing. I was around entrepreneurs and aspiring business people Fantastic. every day. So you kind of took the I guess the mindset of, of becoming an entrepreneur through those people that you were interacting with every day. Mainly with my mom. Oh, wow. My mom was the Avon lady. Right. She sold Avon and during the convocation, which was when the Church of God in Christ would meet, right. we had a barbecue stand. And my mom, she was also the candy lady. So she was the candy lady. She sold barbecue and hot dogs and stuff during the convocation. We had to sleep on the floor and let the saints sleep in our bed. Wow. Yeah, we, we rented our home out to the uh, Church of God in Christ com uh, uh, convocation uh, um, people that would come. Um, I forgot what they call them now. Delegates. That's right. what they'd call them, the delegates. The delegates okay. were coming. The delegates are coming. And then I shined shoes at Mason Temple. Okay. Uh, I carried luggage. I knew what time the bus was coming. I was there. I brought the luggage up and then made sure it got loaded in the, the uh, cabs to, to the different hotels. So I uh, and I made my own money. Right. I parked cars. Come right. on in. Get in here. Park right here. We got paid for parking cars. We got right. paid for shining shoes, carrying luggage. So I made money. I was used to making money. My mom was the Avon lady, the candy lady. So we was used to making money. Now tell me about your dad. What, what your dad? My dad was absent. Oh. Uh, my dad wasn't in my life. That's reason I uh, selected to be around uh, men of caliber. Uh, my pastor was one. These old men in the mechanic shop and the old men at the barber shop. Uh, some of them, they were all old to me because I was a youngster. Some of them were wasn't as old. Uh, I had some um, medium age men. All these men, uh, I surrounded myself around to be able to uh, learn how to be a man because my mom could only teach me to the best of her ability. Fantastic. Well, listen, this is the journey mm -hmm. with Mr. Charles Ewing of Ewing Moving and Storage Inc. Charles, you talked about not being having having a, a father there. How important did those men become in your development as a young man? Those men uh, were very pivotal in my life. Without those men, I wouldn't be the man today that I am. A, a, a boy needs to be around a man, and he needs to be around a real man. These men taught me everything. That's really a sagging. I could never sag because I was taught to wear a belt at an early age. I don't have to worry about uh, They taught me how to provide for my home. They taught me that it's a man's uh, responsibility to provide for his home. They taught me to don't go and get married, uh, and buy a house and get married, but get married, then buy a house. I mean, these were things that were important. I'm like, well, why would I not go? And I got money. Why come I can't go buy a house? He said, because if you buy a house, you're, uh, you're going to have to end up buying another one because your wife is not going to like it. You need to buy it together. Wow, uh, they taught nice. me about uh, at an early age, I did uh, make a mistake and get a young lady pregnant. And I was going to leave the young lady because I, I was trying to leave her anyway. The guy told me, my pastor told me, he said, boy, said, you are responsible for that child. He said, and you don't start being responsible when they get here. You're responsible for the next nine months shaping and creating that child. He said, you go and you do everything you can to take care of that girl for the next nine months because it's going to affect the rest of your life. How old were you? I was 19. You was 19 when you had your first child. I was 19. No, I was 25. I'm sorry. Okay. I was 25. Okay. okay. I was 25 when I had my first child. So let's go back. Still, let's go back early years. Mm -hmm. Tell me about a fond memory of you sitting in the elementary school. Oh, man. Uh, elementary school to me was, was phenomenal. I loved elementary school. Uh, I just, uh, my son was pastoring my third grade teacher, and we just buried her about 
six months ago. Oh, wow. And she was all she could do was tell my son about uh, being my third grade teacher. Uh-huh. Uh, all of my teachers, I remember them all the way from the first to the sixth grade. All, and, and all of them have come back to be a part of my life today in some form of fashion. As, as a child, I played Ray Charles. We would have talent shows at school, and I played Ray Charles in the talent show. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether they caught that because my name was Charles. I figured that I would make a good Ray Charles, or I was dark-skinned and, and, <laughs> and wore shades. So anyway, <laughs> I played Ray Charles in, this, in the school talent uh, uh, performance. In school, school, I was always smart. I was always one that believed in doing my work. I, I was a, almost a straight A student in school because I, I wanted to be successful mm-hmm. and we were taught to be successful. Uh, in that day and era, um, you, all of your teachers encouraged you to reach for the sky, reach for your goals, dream big. And we did that. I mean, they would constantly, the programs that we would have in the auditorium would all be about dreaming big and being successful. And we did that. So Booker T. Washington, because that's what it sounds like. That sounds that's like some Booker to. T. Yes. Because, and they always talk about, you know, we, we lead and others follow. Yes, There's sir. always kind of these kind of slogans as it relates to Booker T. Washington. Mm-hmm. Tell me about your time at Booker T. Washington and give me a memory that was one, of an amazing memory, a fine memory, but also give me the other side of the coin, a not so fine memory of you being at BTW. At BTW, um, Booker T. Washington, I'm, I was, I was at that time. Now I'm, I'm, I'm 15, 16, 17 years old, 15, 16. I'm feeling myself, uh-huh. you know, <laughs> I'm thinking that I got it all going on. You know, I was doing good. Uh, my homeroom teacher at Booker T. Washington was Miss Griffin, and Miss Griffin was over all of the major majorettes. Okay. And all of the major majorettes had to come to her class at one time or another, and I'd be right there. We had the <laughs> most beautiful major majorettes. They had the prettiest legs. <laughs> oh, man, they had big, pretty legs, and I, I'm telling you, that, that was, that's where I got stuck. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, Booker T. Washington, those were fun times at Booker T. Washington. We had um, at that time, we had um, areas of, of of skills. You could go and you could take brick mason, you could take take plastering, mm-hmm. you could take auto mechanics, and I was in plastering. And then they had the uh, the little group called the International Players Association, you know. Mm-hmm. So we was all around there, all the guys that we would uh, dressing was a big thing there, custom made. Uh, 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 slack suits and custom made suits and and hairdos and right. everything. We had all our different things, so that was popular at Booker right. T. Washington. Right. Uh, but w- that was the fondest things of it. But in um, came time to graduate. Right. We had a strict principal. His mm-hmm. name was Mister Mose Walker. Mm-hmm. Mose Walker uh, was very uh, uh, strong and a stickler. For tradition. Right. And uh, the traditional thing was you had to wear this little small black bow tie. Right. And the little small black bow tie and, the, and the, uh, uh, you know, the shirts with the ridges in it uh, right. Right. for our tuxedo shirts. Right. Well, I wanted to do my own thing. And I told uh, uh, Principal uh, Walker that if I couldn't wear my big bow tie, I wasn't going to take no picture. Unless I could wear my big bow tie. He said, well, if you wear that big bow tie, you won't be in the yearbook. He said, because you're going to do it the way I say, or you're not going to be in the yearbook and you will be forgotten. That's what he told me. I chose not to wear the small bow tie and uh, did not get in the yearbook. So in the class of 1977, you won't find me in BTW's yearbook because I was smelling myself. And I did not, uh, I refused to uh, wear the small bow tie, and I wanted my own bow tie, so I didn't end up in the yearbook. So what did you learn? What what, what was the lesson there? The lesson was uh, respect authority. Because, Mm. and and be careful about the things that's going to impact you for the rest of your life. Your decisions are critical. And the, the critical decision I made there I chose to not be in a historical yearbook uh, and didn't know that I should have 
right. that I made a bad decision. That right. was a bad decision. I should have humbled myself and pulled the bow tie off, put the bow tie on that they had for everybody. Everybody right. was a standard bow tie. Right. And took the picture and been in the yearbook. But my class, uh, they loved me. So 20 years later, I was the uh, keynote speaker for our 20 year class reunion. Wow. Yeah. Talk about coming full circle. Full Being circle. Being forgotten to being the, the keynote speaker. Yes, sir. So you transitioned to adulthood. Yes. What was that like? What was that pivotal moment when you when you realized you were an adult, you were an adult mm -hmm. and you have to make decisions as an adult? Mm -hmm. I, I, I made a few bad decisions, uh, meaning that I, I started galloping with the gang uh, and started doing things that were that would get me arrested. I never wanted to go to jail. I always said I wasn't going to jail. I said, if the Lord keep me out of the army, I keep myself out of jail. Wow. <laughs> uh, because I, it was the draft period. During my era, you get right. drafted. So you right. didn't have a choice about going right. uh, if you got drafted. So the Lord blessed and kept me out of the army. The draft ended the year I graduated. And so when the draft ended, that kept me out of the army. And then so I kept myself out of jail. But I did some things that probably should have gotten me in there. But the Lord kept me. And at the age of 20, that was in 1980, that was uh, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. 40 years ago, I decided to follow Jesus, give my life to Christ. I gave my life to Christ. I was smoking dope. I was smoking cigarettes. I was drinking liquor. I was chasing women. I was gambling. I was doing it all. And I turned my whole life around. And it was strange how it happened. I said, Lord, if you help me stop smoking. I wanted to get control. I've always been a control freak. And I only wanted to control my life. I wanted to control Charles. Right. And I asked the Lord to help me stop smoking for seven days. I said, Lord, if you help me stop smoking for seven days, I will never touch another cigarette a day in my life. I stopped smoking for seven days. The eighth day he saved me. Oh, wow. My mom called me. She said, son, she said, any man that see he needs to make a change and is afraid to make that change is less than a man. She insulted my intelligence because I thought I was the man. Right. And when she made that statement to me, any man that see he needs to make a change to better himself and is afraid to make that change is less than a man. She was telling me, give your life to Christ. And if it doesn't work, try something else. But I guarantee you it'll work. Wow. I gave my life to Christ on the eighth day. The ninth day I stopped drinking. The twelfth day I stopped smoking cigarettes. I mean, stopped smoking dope. Mm -hmm. Hadn't smoked any dope. Hadn't smoked any cigarettes. Had done some other things back again. But those two I hadn't. And so the Lord blessed. I started focusing on growing my business. Mm -hmm. I started focusing on making an honest living. I was selling dope. I stopped selling dope and started selling produce. I would go down to the Scott Street's market and buy up produce and resell it in the community. Mm -hmm. I sold watermelons, peaches, cantaloupes. I sold that. I went back to um, working two jobs. I was delivering papers to the Press cemeter for the press cemeter to right. the boys to throw papers. Right. I was also working in housekeeping and in working in housekeeping and delivering bundles and selling produce. I said, Lord, I got to do more with my life than this. Mm -hmm. I realized then that I didn't have enough education. So I went back to school. That was in 1983. Mm -hmm. I went back to school in 1983, got my associate's degree from Southwest Community College mm -hmm. in business uh in business administration. Mm -hmm. And got, when I got that degree in business administration, I got promoted within the commercial appeal from the housekeeping department to the engraving department. Right. I did a four year apprenticeship in the engraving department and became a journeyman engraver. Mm -hmm. As a journeyman engraver, it took my salary up to over twenty five thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And that was back in 1985. Right. So I stayed there from uh, eighty three up until 93. Mm -hmm. And then I left there. By that time, I had seven trucks. In 1985, I bought my first truck. 
So you was working. I was working at Commercial Appeal. You was working at Commercial Appeal and you and, and you and moving service. Wow. I started. I bought. I, I started moving uh, when the Press Cemetery went out of business. I had a truck. Mm-hmm. So my boss at the Press Cemetery recommended me to move one of the uh, managers to there. Right. I moved him, and he told me, "So I gave you two tips. One, go in business for yourself, and two, don't charge anybody else less than one hundred twenty-five dollars." I charged him seventy five. He gave me one twenty five. A fifty dollar tip mm-hmm. was one of the tips, and the other one was go in business. Right. And I took my pickup truck, started moving people. Then I started renting U hauls and moving people. I, while I was still so wait a minute, what a you telling me? Job. What I hear you saying is success wasn't no like no straight trajectory, no sir. no straight incline, straight line. You tell me about a dip. Tell me about the day that. Things didn't look so promising after you made it, after you felt like you made it. After I felt like I made it is probably when I left Commercial Appeal. Okay. I was doing all right and uh, doing pretty good. Uh, I had just When I left Commercial Appeal, I bought my building. I moved downtown. I had my own facilities. And then... Um, I got involved uh, uh, with moving and everything. It went pretty good up until I uh, became involved with the Grizzlies, uh, bought the Grizzlies uh, as a local owner, uh, went a few years after that. Then the bottom fell out. The bottom fell out, I think it was 2008, 2009. Right. 2008, that's, 2008. Yeah, that's the tech year. That everything, all the bottom fell out, man. You talking about uh, crazy times, man. That was crazy times, man. Um, at the same time, the bottom had fallen out there. I had sold my ownership in the Grizzlies. I wasn't involved with them anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was struggling because people had stopped doing business with me because they uh, said, well, he's successful. Right. He's a Grizzly owner. He don't need our business anymore. Right. So not only did the economy tank, My business tanked, and, man, all I could do was just rely. I I went to my accountant, Mm -hmm. and my accountant told me that was Watkins Mm Uberall. He said, go home and prepare for bankruptcy. He said, go home and prepare for bankruptcy. He said, because I'd hate for you to get set out over there on Cherry Road uh, and be an embarrassment. Go on on and prepare. I went back and got in my prayer closet, Mm -hmm. and the Lord told me, you ain't got to file for no bankruptcy. Prepare for hard work. And I went out, man, and started working harder and pushing my business and working to do and, and figuring out how to diversify. Magic Johnson uh, put a book out called uh, Reinventing Yourself. Mm-hmm. And I took that book from Magic and read it and got a few lines out of it and uh, reinvented myself, recreated myself. Mm-hmm. I just diversified. Anything that had anything to do with transportation, I made it a part of my plight. Okay. And okay. that's how I was able to maintain and get. I diversified. I did government business. I did military moves. I did commercial moves. I did FF&E. I did brokering. I did everything. Kind of mitigated your risk. I Ooh. did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, it's the last question. Okay. You're talking to boys. You're talking to men that's going to be looking at this forever. Mm-hmm. What would you say to them today about how they can get their life going in the direction that you would you think that it should be going? I'd have to go at it from a construction perspective. Okay. And your life is part of a construction project. Build your life on a solid foundation. If you build it on a solid foundation, as you continue to build, the structure may uh, waver sometime, but the foundation going to keep you going. It's going to keep you grounded so you can make it. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. That's the foundation I built my business on. I, I, it has wavered a lot of times. It have, it have gotten off course, but I bring it back to that foundation. And with that solid foundation, you'll be able to withstand all of the fiery dots that Satan is going to throw at you because you'll be grounded. 
You'll be rooted. And I guarantee you, that's the best advice I can give you. If you're if you're a father, t- introduce your child to Jesus Christ. If you're a child, learn all you can, can all you learn, learn about him. And I guarantee you, it'll pay off in the long run. We don't have anything more else to say after that, <laughs> as, as Forrest would say. And that's all I'm going to say about that. And, and <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Charles, thank you. Thank you for coming in and being a part of the journey. Thank you for your words of wisdom. Thank you for being transparent. Yes, sir. Listen, you've been listening to the journey on the Kazookian Network. And today we've had Mr. Charles Ewing of Ewing Moving and Storage, Inc. Come back. We got more coming. So the next episode will be soon. So you come on back. But listen, Charles Ewing Moving and Storage, Inc. Read about him. If you see him out, talk to him, because I tell you, he's a man with a lot going on and a man that could give you a lot to think about as well as preparing your life to be a success. Thank you. Take care. The Journey, hosted by Larry Robinson, executive producer, the Delta Boulay.